Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Hi, uh, thank you all for joining us. So we will get started. It's 102. Um, if anyone's having any uh, tech issues, feel free to, to write me a message. I just wanted to let everyone know up front. I uh, am Nathaniel, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator for the Office of Children and Family Services. Really excited to be here at this today and to uh, open us up. And I will be uh, introducing some of our other staff in just a little bit. What I would ask is that um, for the duration of this portion, if everyone can stay muted, um, because we are going to be presenting, but there will be time for questions at the end. Um, and there are also, please, if you have any questions, uh, rather than coming off mute and just asking, if you could type it in the chat, promise you we will make sure we get to them. Um, and if we don't have an answer today, we will get the answers uh, for you. So thank you again. Um, this is also being recorded and will be shared out to everyone who registered for today's event. Uh, so we greatly appreciate it. Now, uh, welcome to OCFS's uh, 2021 virtual job fair. So we have an agenda for today. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about who we are, OCFS as an agency, the Office of Children and Family Services, uh, about what we do as an agency, the different work that we, uh, that we do, the, the communities that we serve, um, we're going to talk a bit about how you might start out in your first job with OCFS and then what a career looks like moving on from that first position. Um, we're going to discuss some specific vacancies that we have right now um, in our juvenile justice facilities and programming. Um, we're going to hear from a staff who has uh, made that climb from uh, starting out in one of the facilities and is now uh, an assistant director. And, uh, and then, like I said, hopefully we'll have time at the end for question and answers. So without further ado, uh, this is our contact information. Again, these slides will be sent out so you'll get it. Um, but if you need to reach out to Human Resources, here's the email address and phone and fax, as well as the DEI office, which is where my position is placed. Um, this, this info will be at the end of, as well. All right, so who we are as an agency. Well, OCFS's core mission is um, to serve New York's public by promoting the safety, permanency, and well-being of our children, families, and communities. We will achieve results by setting and enforcing policies, building partnerships, and funding and providing quality services. So within, um, within, and sorry, Jean, I don't, think I have access to what the number is. So I, I don't know how to, to support that, um, that ask. So, and yes, these are New York positions, but let me just get through this first position, first part, and then we'll ask, answer some questions. So we have a, a new diversity office. Uh, I am very excited to be the DEI coordinator, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we are, have an officer, a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer starting soon. Uh, and that position will be running the office. We're very excited about that. Um, but we've also just recently committed to a five-year strategic plan. So what does that mean? Well, we sat down and looked at the work that we're doing for diversity, equity, inclusion, asked ourselves how we could constantly be improving on that, um, and then figured out how we're going to make that work happen. So we have some subcommittees. Um, that we use within the organization that help us to do diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, so we have these six subcommittees. We have a subcommittee devoted to staff development, recruitment and retention, uh, SOGI, which stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity and Expression. It's the LGBTQ focus group. Uh, we have a, a subcommittee that focuses on policy and data analysis on diversity, equity, and inclusion events. Uh, we actually just had a great event yesterday for our Native American Heritage Month, watched an incredible documentary uh, and heard from some, some amazing panelists about it. Um, and then also a diversity, equity, and inclusion champions subcommittee. The champion subcommittee is a really unique, interesting space. People get together and try to navigate some of the difficult conversations that we're all having in our culture and society right now. Um, and, and doing it here at work. It, it's, it's been a really um, valuable group and all of these subcommittees are critical to helping us move our, our diversity, equity and inclusion goals along. Um, so as I'd mentioned, we have these subcommittees, they meet on a monthly basis. Sometimes they meet even more often than that if there are certain projects they're working on. Um, each of them will focus on a different area. So for example, the SOGI subcommittee, which I actually co-chair, 
um, is the, uh, we just finished uh, the LGBTQ plus community practice model. It is a, it's guidance on how we as an agency will work with all people uh, of, of all sexual orientations and gender identities and support them. So that was a project that they focused on. Um, the recruitment and retention subcommittee has been focused on doing a re redacted resume review process, also really important to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and the policy subcommittee has been working on guidance uh, on a guide for us and our policymakers to really think through as they're writing policies, how can we make sure that they are equitable policies from the beginning? So these are some of the, some of the great efforts that these subcommittees um, have, have really pushed forward. We're thrilled about them. Um, they are open to new employees. So if this is something you'd be interested in supporting, um, just let us know. That's the email address right there, dei at ocfs.ny.gov. Um, we just also wanted to read off a few testimonials from some staff that we've had over the years. Um, so in the Westchester Regional Office, for example, um, someone wrote that the office was a very warm and friendly work environment. It felt, I felt it was easy to have a good relationship with everyone and glean knowledge while learning. Uh, someone in our home office, which is based here in Albany, it's actually in Rensselaer, just across the river from Albany, um, a great agency to work for, supervise, Supervisors were wonderful mentors. Um, I've enjoyed my positions. There's an excellent training and a very supportive environment. That's at our call center. Um, for the department, uh, our division of juvenile justice and opportunities for youth, which is what we're talking about today. Someone said, it's been a pleasure to work for the juvenile delinquent youth over the years. And I can tell you we have some really great rich programming and excellent staff in there and also from the call center. It's so good to see such giving people. It was nice to be a part of that. And I will throw in my own personal little testimonial and say, I really love it. I enjoy that the work that we do on a daily basis is all geared toward helping um, young people. And it, it feels pretty good at the end of the day. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Rosalind Duval, uh, and she will talk a little bit about what we do here at OCFS. Thank you, Nate. Um, I just want to thank everybody once again for joining us this afternoon for our very first um, OCFS virtual job fair. So I want to talk about the divisions of OCFS that we are comprised of. So the first is our Division of Child Welfare and Community Services, or CWCS. We also have the Division of Child Care Services, or DCCS, Division of Juvenile Justice and Opportunities for Youth, or DJ Joy, Commission for the Blind, or New York um, SCB, Youth Development and Partnerships for Success, which is YDAP. So I know that's a lot of acronyms for you, but these are the divisions that all make up um, the Office of Children and Family Services. So just an agency overview. So OCFS is responsible for programs and services involving foster care, adoption and adoption assistance. Um, we do a lot of the child protective services calls, including operating the statewide central register um, or SCR for child abuse and maltreatment. We also provide services for pregnant adolescents and protective programming for vulnerable adults. So as a state agency, we also respond to the needs of Native Americans on reservations and in the community. We also provide oversight and monitoring of regulated childcare, legally exempt childcare, um, any childcare subsidies, childcare resource and referrals, and the Advantage After School program. Now, all elements of the state's juvenile justice programs administering and managing residential facilities for juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders placed in the custody of the OCFS commissioner. That is also our responsibility. So that's where we're talking about our DJ Joy staff. Um, that's what we do on that end is we operate and um, provide oversight for all of the DJ Joy facilities. And these are both limited, secure and secure. So just this map here shows you where we are located in New York State. So this is our facilities, the community multi-service offices or CMSOs, and our regional offices throughout the state of New York. So we actually have nine DJ Joy facilities at this time. I believe there are still 13 CMSO locations open, as well as eight regional offices. We have a few on this map as well, if you're looking at it. 
um, that shows a few that are just outside on their own. They still are under um, OCFS's purview and it's under our oversight. They're just not called CMSOs or regional offices or facilities, but there are still other locations that we use across the state of New York. Could you just um, spell out CMSO and maybe, I don't know if I even know what that means. <laughs> oh, so that is our community multi-service offices. So that's where we are located right in the community. We can provide services for youth that are leaving the um, residential facilities that we maintain. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So from your first job to a career, so we do want to give everybody an idea of what types of jobs are here at OCFS. So we do have direct care or essential jobs as well as non-essential jobs. So on the direct care side of things, we have our youth division aides and our child protective services specialists, as well as our teachers. So the youth division aides and child protective services specialists, they, these staff can be assigned to a daytime, evening, or an overnight shift because these are all operated on a 24-7 basis. Now our YDAs are stationed primarily in the DJ Joy facilities and our community multi-service offices. So if you are stationed at a facility or if that's something that really interests you, then just to give you the heads up, you'll be working directly with youth in those residential centers and they can range from the ages of 13 to 21. And for our child protective services specialists, they are operating in the state central register hotline. So again, that is a 24 seven um, operation that is run on that end. For our non-essential, um, not to say that we're not important, but it's just, we are classified differently. So that includes myself, who's in the human resources specialist office on this end. Um, we also have our contract management specialists, our call center representatives, which are part of our consolidated call center, children and family services specialists, and our fire and safety representatives. Now, this is not a all encumbering list. It's just to give you an idea of what kind of positions are available here with the Office of Children and Family Services. I know we have a few asterisks there um, on the non-essential side of things. So just so that everybody knows, the Children and Family Services specialists, as well as our fire and safety representatives, there may be some travel involved in that job. So now that I have given you a lot of information, lots of acronyms, a lot of, um, information about the types of jobs that we have here, I wanna talk a bit about these salaries. So we do offer a competitive salary and we offer geographic and shift differentials and opportunities for overtime. So just to put it into perspective, I know some may not be as familiar with state service as, as others on this call this afternoon, but each title is associated with a salary grade and then there is a range of salary for each title. So we have a few listed here. Again, this is not an inclusive list of all the titles we have, but we just wanna put out some of the more popular titles that we have. So you're looking at an office assistant one, that's equated to a grade six and the salary range is listed there. So it goes the same for the YDAs, um, the two specifically our CCR ones or our call center representative ones our YDA threes, our YDA fours, and OA threes, or office assistant threes, our YCs, which are youth counselors, our CFSS um, and HRS ones, those can range between a grade 13 and an 18. And then you get into the more higher level positions or managerial positions where you'd be supervising staff. So if anybody is wondering, when you look at the YC one, the CFSS and the HRS line, we have a range from a 13 to an 18. The reason for that is because those um, positions offer opportunities for a traineeship. So if you have a bachelor's degree, for example, or you have some level of experience, then um, you would start at a grade 13 in a traineeship and then slowly move your way up to a grade 18. So I know that's a lot of numbers to be throwing at you, but I want to throw out the fun numbers now. So for your salary range, um, we all love our job here, but we all also do it because we like to get a paycheck as well and we need to support our families outside of the office. So each one that you see here, the lowest salary is actually where the hiring uh, rate is. So that's where you're starting for each of these positions. That higher salary that you see toward the end, that's the job rate. So you're working your way up to the job rate each year. So usually it takes about six to seven years until you reach the ending job rate. 
And these salaries are always updated. There are constantly changes to the salary on an annual basis based on the collective bargaining agreements and the current salary schedule. It is always available right on the Governor's Office of Employee Relations website. So if you go there and you click on salary schedules, that's where you can see um, what your salary is for the current year if you'd like to. Um, you can even look to see what the salary is several years ago and then what the projected salaries will be based on those current collective bargaining agreements. All right, so now that I have given you some fun information now for some more information about the benefits that you're offered as a state employee. So as with any state agency, you get paid time off, which includes vacations and holidays. You also are given sick leave because we understand that there are things that happen outside of the workplace. You get sick. Um, we don't want you to be in a position where you're not getting paid because you're out sick or you have an illness that's a longstanding issue. We also offer personal leave. So usually you get five days of personal leave each year. And depending on the job you're in, there may be some differences. So just um, when you, if you're applying for the job, you will be notified of any differences in the vacation, any sick time or personal time that you would be provided as an employee. We also um, offer time for any paid professional development leave. So that's if you're going in for any trainings that are required as a part of your job, any certif cert certifications that you're going in for, um, or any seminars or um, any other conferences that you'd like to attend that are going to make you um, a better employee and are just beneficial for your job. We also have an optional deferred compensation retirement plan that is actually handled right through the retirement system. So when we're onboarding you, um, if, we, if you are selected as a candidate for this agency, then you'll get information about applying for deferred comp. We also offer medical, dental, and vision insurance, um, short and long-term disability coverage. We offer flexible spending accounts for both health and dependent care. So what this does is it allows you to take out monies from your paycheck so that way you're not getting tax on it. So it's all before tax. Um, I used to do this myself from dependent care and it was fantastic. I'm really a proponent of this program and a huge advocate for it. Um, it's just that you set money aside to pay for that dependent care, pay for your health care expenses throughout the year. And finally, we, we also have union sponsored and agency sponsored tuition reimbursement. I feel like I'm the poster child for this sometimes. Um, you can always get a reimbursement from any one of the unions. So that is PEF, CSEA, or MC. Um, you just, they essentially say you'd have to get a certain grade and then you'll get reimbursed. I understand that some of the unions will give you a voucher so that you can go ahead and take classes. So this is really helpful. Um, just thinking about your career long-term, if it's something that you're interested in to go and get your bachelor's, say maybe say you started uh, working on college, you have your associate's degree the state will assist you in paying for tuition so you can get a bachelor's degree or even further. Thank you. <clears throat> so now to move on to some information from the Career Mobility Office. So the Career Mobility Office is actually based from civil service. So they offer a lot of different services for um, any state employee about mobility in general and training to address current workforce needs. So some of the resources that they offer is information about the merit system, and that's something that is developed and maintained and established under civil service law for all state agencies. They also provide a glossary of titles. So you can actually go in and look for your title or a title that you're interested in to see what the trajectory looks like or what your career ladder may look like. They also offer trainings there as well as customized career counseling. So there you can just call them or email them and set up an appointment with them to see what kind of uh, services they offer. So employee services, on the other hand, they provide um, employee services for resume preparation. If you're looking for a job, they help you find a job that pairs well with your skills and your experience. Um, they also do career planning on there and, and they give you tips for interviewing. So I wanna make all of this come together for you that are on the call this afternoon. So we pulled a few titles so you can see what that trajectory looks like. Um, so for the CFSS ones, those child and family services specialist ones, they can start at a grade 18 as a one and then bump up to a CFSS two as a grade 23. 
they can later go into a Children and Family Services Program Manager 1, which is equated to a salary grade 25. Then they can keep moving up to either the Children and Family Services Specialist 3 or a Children and Family Services Program Manager 2. So I wanted to pull a few titles that some may be more familiar with or may be more interested in these other titles. So for the Youth Division Aid titles, the YDA2 is usually where you start and that's equated to a salary grade nine. So then you can move up to a YDA3 or a YDA4. So just to clarify, the YDA3s currently are stationed in our residential facilities and the YDA4s are stationed in our secure facilities. So there is a slight change in the salary grade there, but it's a position where you can move into that from a YDA2 or a grade nine position. You can move right up to a grade 12 or a grade 14 position. The next step for the YDAs is oftentimes a YC1 or a youth counselor one. So that is also a grade 18 position. And then you can bump up to a youth counselor two, which is equated to a salary grade 21. Now to go to our call center reps. So your call center rep one typically starts at a grade nine. And these positions, just so that everybody is aware, for both the YDA twos and the CCR ones, there are opportunities for hourly positions or temp positions. So just don't be afraid of applying for a temporary position because it really can get your foot in the door and lead to a career for you. So going back to the CCR ones, the CCR ones can bump up to a CCR two or call center rep two. So this is a supervisory item that somebody can move into after you gain some experience um, just working in the call center there. Then you can bump up to a call center representative three, which is equated to a grade 17. And then um, hopefully in your career, you can go up to a call center rep four, which is a grade 20. So we just wanna illustrate that there are ways to move and these trajectories that we've listed here, they all follow the same chain. So you have your CFSS one to the two, the YDA two to a YDA three or four, your CCR one to a CCR two. But there are other opportunities for transfer, which we'll get into next. Mm -hmm. So, I want to first start with appointment mechanisms. So there are several different ways you can be appointed to a permanent item with the state of New York in general and OCFS. So we do have a 55 BC option. So this is out there for anybody who has a disability or you're a veteran. You can actually get appointed to a permanent position without taking an examination. For our permanent positions, many times that will be our office assistant one. So you're starting at around a salary grade six. Um, if you have a bachelor's degree or some other uh, type of education, a master's degree, a PhD, whatever it is you have, you can also qualify to go into a traineeship, which will start normally at a grade 13 and get you up to a grade 18. So I talked a little bit about that. Um, the competitive appointments, usually those are um, based on an eligible list. So this means you've taken a civil service examination and now you're on the list for a potential candidate for a position. We also have non-competitive appointments. So that's where there is no examination um, that is being used to appoint somebody. So th that's where we find the YDA titles most often is that those are all our non-competitive appointments that we're making there. So we're really basing your uh, minimum qualifications on your experience as well as your education. We also have decentralized lists where that's um, similar to a non-competitive where it's based on your experience and your education. So we'll look to see if you have the right credentials and then we can see if we can appoint you. We also appoint um, staff based on a provisional basis. So that was gonna be a mechanism we use if there is not an examination or a viable list that we can use to appoint people. We also have non-competitive promotions. It's kind of the same idea or thought process if we don't have enough candidates who are interested or we do not have a viable list, which is usually three or more candidates that are on that list. We can also use a non-competitive promotion to move someone up. There are also, also training and experience exams that are held. And as I said earlier, you can also be appointed on a temporary or hourly basis. And again, it's a great way to get your foot in the door. Um, now to move on to transfer mechanisms. So there are three different types of transfer mechanisms that staff can use to their advantage while they're working for the state. For one, we have our voluntary transfers between agencies when an exam is not required. So this means that you are doing a 
two grade jumps. So if you're at an 18 and you wanna to go to a grade 20, that's your two grade jump right there. If you're going to from a 23 to a 25, that's also gonna be where you can use that voluntary transfer between um, different jobs and without the need of an examination. Another um, transfer mechanism is to go from one title to another. As long as your duties are similar in nature, you can actually move from one job to another. So for myself personally, I came to human resources from tax and finance. So the job and the duties were similar enough that I could do a transfer into another uh, title or position that wasn't in the direct line. Now, normally with this style of transfer, you have to be on an eligible list. So you had to have taken an examination that qualifies you for that particular position. So that's gonna be something that's really used more commonly for employees who already are working for the state. They may be working for another agency. So the final one is just voluntary transfers between administrative titles. So I know that's a lot of information right there. That's something you'll be looking at as a state employee. If you get into a managerial position, that's when you're gonna be using that option a bit more frequently where you're looking to jump from maybe a children and family services program manager to, to say an associate director in another um, title or chain. So to talk a little bit about examinations, because we did touch on that just now. So the a big one that is always promoted, um, very heavily used, we use it a lot to appoint various positions is the Professional Careers Opportunities Exam or the PCO examination. So it fills over 100 entry level positions across multiple agencies. So these are your traineeship positions where you can go from a 13 to an 18. Or you could also be appointed on the full level based on your education and your experience. And we have the link here. So when we send out the um, PowerPoint for everybody, feel free to click on that link and see the test guide. And then you can also see information on what jobs are used or what jobs um, are filled using the Professional Careers Opportunities exam. So another exam that we promote and use uh, frequently is the Public Administration Traineeship Transition Exam or the PATT exam. So this is used to promote um, qualified clerical staff and secretarial and administrative employees. So these are usually um, used for staff that are already New York State employees. Rosalind, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this in the moment, but um, Catherine Banks asks if the PCO is being offered again this year. That is an excellent question. I will take that back and I just have to check on civil services website to see when that examination will be posted again. However, to answer that question, one way to get alerted for any examinations that are upcoming or something that seems like it may match with your skill set, if you haven't already done so, certainly uh, sign up for the examination announcement on civil service. That's a great way to get the information and figure out when examinations are going to be held. Alrighty, so our current vacancies, we have a ton of vacancies right now, as you can see, we are looking for call center reps, we are looking for cooks, cleaners, fire and safety representative ones, office assistants, we are looking for licensed master social workers, maintenance assistants, psychologists, youth counselor ones, we are looking for youth division aides, teachers, voc instructors, and trades generalists. And then we're always looking for nurses, um, that is something on our decentralized list. So if you know anybody that is a nurse or you're a nurse yourself and you're looking to have a change of pace, please consider us um, because we, we are always looking for nurses. We need our nurses in the facilities um, to provide any medical services to the youth that are in our care. And the another continuous recruitment is our child protective services specialist. Um, that is also an examination that um, we're using that decentralized portion to get your experience and your education to fill those positions. And all of these vacancies, anytime we post anything, we always use State Jobs NY. So um, visit that site frequently. That is where you're going to find the most up-to-date vacancies um, for OCFS and just state agencies in general. And now, 
for active recruitment, we are currently looking for Youth Division Aid 2s and Youth Division Aid 3s and 4s. So I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but we're really in need of Youth Division Aids for our secure and limited secure facilities um, where you're working directly with youth in the residential um, facilities. And that's going to be your secure and limited secure. And again, those ages of youth range from 13 to 21. So for the Youth Division Aid 2, we have the minimum qualifications up here. So you'll need one year of satisfactory full-time experience. So that's going to be working with youth under the age of 21 or one year full-time experience um, and a high school graduation or equivalency diploma. For our YDA 3s and 4s, um, we're looking for two years of full-time experience uh, with youth under the age of 21 or two years of full-time experience in um, the care prog programming and or secure custody of residential clients in a healthcare, mental hygiene, or correctional institution setting. Um, we will also accept an associate's degree and six months of experience as described, or we can just take a bachelor's degree and that automatically qualifies you to be appointed to the Youth Division Aid 3 or 4. We can also accept a high school graduation or equivalency diploma and one year of experience. So as you can see um, with this job, because it's non-competitive, we have a lot more control over who we can select and who we can appoint to these positions. So we're really leaning on your experience as well as your education and your background. All right, thank you so much, Rosalind. There are a couple more questions that people wrote in to me and I thought I would just ask you if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. So someone asked about um, physical locations when it comes to call center work. Um, so can you just give us an idea of where those call centers are? So we have one call center. Um, it is located um, in Menans. So, it's, I believe that they have the opportunity for staff to work from home a couple days a week at this time. Um, but that would be the location for you is just at that consolidated call center located in Menans. It's not too far from Rensselaer. It's just outside of downtown Albany. Um, it looks like they got free parking over there. So that's always a plus. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, I hope that covers it. Was there yeah, a follow-up no, question on that one? Does. No, that definitely does. There was also a question about positions in the Rochester area. Mm -hmm. Are there, um, so I know that we have some facilities in, in the Finger Lakes area, which is not too far. Are there other positions or, or locations around there? Um, yes, we have several locations in the Rochester area. So we have um, Industry is the residential facility that is located um, right in Rochester. We also have a CMSO and a regional office um, located in Rochester. And it looks like we have a Buffalo CMSO and regional office in that area, as well as a couple offices in Syracuse. So if you go onto the State Jobs NY website, you're gonna see all of the vacancies that are currently posted. And you can actually, um, in that website, you can tailor it so that you're looking at specific regions. So if you just wanna put in Western New York, you can certainly do that. And then it's gonna bring up anything that we have available in the Rochester area. Great, thank you so much. And then I um, what I found the, the website that you can go look to learn more about exams, to sign up and create an account to be notified about exams. Um, so I've dropped that link into the chat. And then someone asked me, um, there have been two questions that have come in about when tests will be offered and given. Um, and I, I'm not a fan of, of a non-answer, but unfortunately OCFS doesn't set those um, exams. That is all that is all owned and run in a different state agency called civil service. So um, we're sort of at the mercy of their system. Um, and as you can probably all imagine, it's been a very interesting 19 months um, working through COVID, trying to figure out all of this stuff. So um, I'm sorry that there haven't been more uh, common, but um, we're hopeful that there will be more coming up soon. Um, so with that, uh, we want to share with you um, the the voice of a specific person who's done this, you know, who's who started out in one of the facilities as a YDA and has worked their way up to being a so going from a YDA two to a YDA three, having a youth counselor position and then stepping into being an assistant facility director and now um, being a youth facility director too. 
So with that, I'm going to stop sharing screen and we're going to ask um, Eddie Figueroa to, to chat up a little bit about his experience, um, you know, starting out with OCFS in a facility, if you want to tell us where, and then uh, talk a little bit about your trajectory. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Eddie Figueroa. I am the facility director for the Brentwood Residential Center for Girls located in Dix Hills, Long Island. Uh, I've been with the agency. I'm going into my 21st year. Uh, and yes, it happens very fast. Um, I started with the agency as actually an hourly um, uh, YDA2 uh, back in June of 2001. Um, I was a YDA2 for roughly, uh, I want to say, three months before I became a YDA3. I worked, I started in a facility in the Bronx, uh, it's called Southern New York Residential Center, uh, primarily working with boys. Um, as a YDA, I was responsible for the day-to-day -day movements of the, of the boys, making sure that they were uh, complying with program, making sure that they were um, uh, complying with the rules, doing schoolwork. I was responsible for mentoring uh, kids uh, and documenting everything. Um, in 2000, and, uh, excuse me, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, I believe Ms. Ms. Duvall basically stated that the state will help folks pay for their education. I'm a product of that. Um, I was able to get vouchers uh, through OCFS and through the state to actually finish my bachelor's degree. Um, I finished my degree in 2005. Once I obtained my degree, that made me eligible to take promotional exams. Uh, I did take the grade 18 youth counselor one exam uh, and scored, I want to say I scored about a 90 on it. Uh, and luck would have it that a youth counselor position opened up in my facility. Uh, so I applied for it and became a youth counselor one in 2007. Um, I was a youth counselor one uh, for approximately six years and part of that responsibility had to do, uh, included court petitions. Um, uh, I was responsible for a unit of 13 uh, family court adjudicated boys. I was responsible for treatment planning, uh, release planning, um, actually meeting with the kids, responsible for supervising roughly 13 to 15 staff, uh, running a facility as an administrator on duty on any given night. Um, I enjoyed the youth counselor one position because it, it got me to know a little bit more about the kids and their families. Um, in 2013, I became an assistant director of the Ella McQueen Reception Center, uh, which was located in Brooklyn. Um, part of my responsibility was uh, making sure that program was running uh, efficiently. Uh, I went from supervising 13 to 15 staff to supervising roughly 40 staff. Uh, in 2014, uh, I actually became the director of Ella McQueen Reception Center, uh, and that opened up a whole lot more responsibility for me. Uh, in 2019, uh, I became the uh, director of the Brentwood Residential Center for Girls. Um, so again, as I stated, you know, there, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, it's going on 21 years ago, if I would have still been with this agency, I probably would have told you no. Um, but I enjoyed the impact that um, sitting with a youth, whether it be a boy or a girl, had. Um, the job can be difficult. Uh, you're dealing with kids who uh, some have come from broken homes, some have done what they had to do to survive. Um, sometimes the job can get physical, whether it's stopping a youth from hurting him or herself. Uh, I remember in some of my days as a YDA uh, being mandated to work 16 hours, um, missing birthdays, missing holidays, uh, working in facility. It's not a Monday through Friday job. Uh, there are times you're going to miss Christmases, you're going to miss Thanksgivings. Um, there are times you're going to go home physically, mentally just drained. Um, but I can tell you that the uh, best part of this job for me is every now and then you'll get that one youth that you don't think you made a difference uh, in their life. And when they leave, the kids are very resourceful and they'll find you. Uh, I had a young man that found me uh, when I worked in the 
for the Ellen McQueen Reception Center that I had had in the Bronx. Um, and I hadn't seen this youth in about seven, eight years. And he, somehow he found me just to have the opportunity to say, I remember conversations we had. I want you to know you made an impact in me uh, uh, on my life. That's the gratifying part of the job. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what these youth have done, they're kids. Um, you know, our agency has had kids that have gone through the system and then all of a sudden become employees. So for me, who better to talk to the kids than someone who's been in their shoes? In my position as a director, I've always liked to meet with each kid and let them know the only difference between me and you is I may not have gotten caught for anything that I did. Um, the, the, it's, it's definitely um, a gratifying job. It's definitely um, a job that sometimes you take home with you and it makes you thankful for what you have, especially if you have children. You know, again, to hear some of these kids' stories, it's, it's they're survivors. Uh, I can say that. Um, but it, it's definitely been a gratifying job. And, you know, when you get to my position, I'm about paying it forward. Uh, someone was there to show me how to do my job. So part of my responsibility as a director is I tell all my staff, my job is to prepare you to do my job. Um, I'm not going to, you know, lie, as Ms. Duvall said, you know, the, the, the benefits um, are amazing. Um, you know, retirement, deferred comp, medical, um, you know, I've, I've done, I've done quite a bit of, uh, um, damage to my body because I was always an athlete growing up. And I can sit and tell you if I've paid over a hundred dollars, uh, for physical therapy, for surgeries, it's a lot. Um, for me also, I think one of the biggest benefits was the fact that I was able to finish school, um, and, and really only have to pay the student fees and for my books, everything else was covered. Um, one of the great things that I thoroughly enjoy about working for this agency is the networking that you do. Um, you know, going to trainings and meeting people throughout the, the state. I mean, not just New York City or not just Long Island. Uh, you build connections and, and you build friendships. There are plenty of people that I've worked with throughout the years that I, I call them friends. Um, it's, it's, it's a good job. Uh, you know, it's, it's a state job, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's gratifying. It can be gratifying. And, and, and like I said, I'm not going to try to candy coat anything. It can be a tough job, uh, but we come back every day and we deal with what we have to deal with. And, and we let the kids know, especially the kids that are incarcerated, uh, we let them know, no, we're here and we're, we're going to try to help you. And, and, and for me, as, as not only as someone who's been with the agency going on 21 years, but also as a father, um, you know, it, it, I enjoy what I do. I, I really do. Thank you so much, Eddie, um, for, for all of that. Um, I, you know, you really laid it out there. I think it's really important for us to think about how tough some of these positions can be, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also when you're focused on the child welfare aspect of it and, and helping these kids, um, is, a, is a really important uh, benefit, along with all of the other benefits. Um, and also so great for you to have climbed up so quickly and to have moved through that, finished school. I mean, that's excellent. That's really excellent. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. So um, we just have a, a few minutes left. Uh, I don't see any other big questions in the chat, but something I wanted to do is just show you quickly. Um, I just dropped in the chat a link to be able to go see all of the available employment opportunities that we currently have at OCFS. And so I just wanted to share screen and kind of show you what you'll what you'll find when you go to that link. Uh, I'm sorry if it's if it's tiny. Let me see if I can. There we go. So when you go to that link, you'll see the employment opportunities um, that we have available. And as you've just heard, these are some of the in-demand positions that we have. Um, so we, uh, are, like, like uh, Rosalind had mentioned up, we're talking about call center reps, we're talking about nurses, nurse practitioners, and YDAs, a youth division aid, which is where Eddie started out. Um, if you uh, are looking for a position, it will ask you if you already work for the state or if you don't work for the state at all. A lot of that has to do with 
what Rosalind had discussed, taking tests, learning about how to sort of navigate all of that. And then you can learn more about being employed with the, with the state government um, and all of the different opportunities we have. And I also know in the chat, it was important for someone to lift up um, that, that not all disabilities are always taken into consideration, even though they should be. Um, and so I just want to uh, acknowledge that there is a page uh, on here about our hiring practices being um, equal opportunity. And that, um, as I'd mentioned in the chat, we do have the New York State Commission for the Blind with us at OCFS. Now that's not to say that we are only focused on that, um, but what has been an amazing opportunity is having some of their leadership with years of experience working with blind uh, people who are looking for work, helping them connect to careers, they've really helped inform a lot of our, DIA, our diversity, equity, and inclusion work as well. Um, so we're always trying to add these, these different layers, these different lenses to our work. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a quick uh, idea of what you're gonna see when you go check out the different positions that are available. Um, so now, oh, I see we have a question in the chat. So the question is, um, do you pay for your classes and then get money back, or do you get a pay voucher first? Um, I remember uh, I got vouchers, um, and I don't know if it's changed. I mean, it's been so long since I, since I got the voucher, but I remember I got vouchers uh, which paid for a certain amount of credits. Uh, I don't remember how many credits were. So what the way I went to school is I would, I was going to school part time because I was obviously working full time. So let's say in the spring semester, I may take two classes and then in the fall semester, I would take another class and the voucher pays for the classes. Um, the only thing I had to pay for was any student fees um, and for my books and that was it. Right. And again, I don't know if things have changed since I've been in, since I graduated school, but that's the way it worked for me. Um, I can also speak on that. I'm actually doing that now. So for the union that represents me, I do have to pay upfront and then I'm reimbursed um, once the semester is over. So I think CSEA still does the voucher system where they pay for it upfront, but then when you go into PEF and MC, you are expected to pay upfront and then they reimburse you at the end of the semester. And I did the same thing that Eddie did of uh, taking one course of semester and then just getting reimbursed. Thank you so much. Awesome. If you have other questions, please feel free to uh, to drop them into the chat. Uh, because at this time, I believe we've we've gotten through all the information we were hoping to cover today. Um, I'm going to leave our our contact information here up on the slide, um, and we'll just you know wait another moment to see if we get any other questions in. Um, I will share that my um, experience working for New York State government has been wonderful. I will also agree with Eddie, the benefits side of it. Um, as someone who came into state work from the sort of gig economy, um, I didn't have insurance. I was always trying to make, make ends meet and uh, working for the state, I've, there's security um, and in it that I, that I didn't know um, that I didn't know about. Um, how do I find out about positions in the training division? Um, Catherine, so I, in, unless it's listed on our site, I don't know that we would have positions available in the training division. Um, but so you may just have to check out on our website and, and continue to, to check and, and see when a, a position is listed. Any other questions? Okay, so one person um, asked if they'll be able to apply for the call center, although they live in New Jersey. So the call center positions um, are not 100% remote yet. Uh, so, the, uh, and, and I don't know that they will be. Um, during COVID, there were opportunities to make them 100% remote, um, but now uh, the state, the entire state uh, positions are back. Uh, working in the office um, at least five days a week. Some people uh, can qualify for a telecommuting program. Um, however, but brand new hires don't qualify uh, for the telecommuting program until after probation. Um, so I, I would just say that the distance may be a barrier to that position because we can't promise it to be 100% remote. Um, yes, these are being recorded and uh, we will be sharing the recording of this as well as the slides from this to everyone who registered today. 
And Regina asks if there's positions available in the New York City Youth Division. Um, and I would again, just direct you to the, to the website we were just looking at that has all the positions open. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, um, I want to say thank you to all of you so much for joining us today. A huge thank you to Eddie for sharing his experiences, his career mobility. Um, really appreciate hearing about that. Um, and of course, an enormous thank you to Rosalind Duval for pu pulling this all together. Um, so I want to uh, just send it back over to you, Rosalind, if you have any parting words or closing thoughts. Um, and, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Yep, thank you everybody for attending and we have our contact information there. If you have any questions about human resources or any diversity, equity and inclusion matters. Awesome, so thank you all so much. Uh, we will be in touch uh, and we hope that you have a wonderful day and weekend. Take care. Bye.